God, what have we done? Well, it all started in late December. I was scrolling through Twitter, enjoying the daily musk bash, and then this happened. I'm not a coder. One semester in uni was literally the only formal education I have on it. And that was mostly creating random number generators. For some reason, that's important for physics students. Anyway, everything else I learned from YouTube, but I always thought that something like input shaping would require more than just a standard mainboard in terms of processing and memory. All right, all right, all right. So I've been burned in the past for not explaining this. For those of you who don't know what input shaping is, gotta be living under a rock at this stage, guys. Input shaping is a feature in some firmware which helps cancel out vibrations. Vibrations are not good for prints. They don't look good. Ever notice those little ripples that seem to echo printed structures? That's called ringing, and it is caused by vibrations. Vibrations are bad. Rigidity is good. Vibrations are caused by a change in the direction of the print head or the bed. A change in direction means higher acceleration, which creates a force on an object, and then vibrations occur from this force. The faster the change in direction, the higher the acceleration, and the more force there is, the worse the vibrations are. So it's beneficial to have a nice light print head on your printer and control accelerations so they don't go too high. But input shaping cancels out these vibrations by signaling the stepper motor to perform an opposite directional change proportional to the unwanted vibration so you can go faster without having to worry about vibrations. Input Shaper tends to use Clipper firmware, which uses a secondary board, which is usually this guy. This is a Raspberry Pi, and it has specs up to 1.5 gigahertz and up to 8 gigabytes of RAM. Well, that's basically a little computer. Compare that to a Creality 4.2.2 board, which has 72 megahertz. It's a glorified calculator. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you can run input shaping on something like that. I mean, the Pi is there just for Octoprint and the variations of it more than anything else, right? A lot of printers these days use this and can push their speeds beyond 400 millimeters per second and their accelerations beyond 8,000 millimeters per second squared. That's pretty insane. If you have ever wondered about Boron printers or the FL Sun V400 or Bamboo Labs printers, that's what we're talking about. And some of these printers can tolerate accelerations up to 20,000 millimeters per second squared. For context, that is the acceleration you experience if you're in a car driving at 10 kilometers an hour and crash while wearing a seatbelt. Whiplash is not good for humans or printers. Anyway, these printers generally use a secondary mainboard to host that special firmware. In the past, this has been a Raspberry Pi, as mentioned earlier, but now manufacturers are using their own specially made boards for this. Some are really cool because you can actually hook them up to four different printers and use them all simultaneously instead of buying four Raspberry Pis for four printers. It's much cheaper this way. But obviously this is still an investment. So if you could get that kind of firmware on your own printer without having to invest in a secondary board, that would be awesome. And maybe now you can. The Ender 3 is the Chung Wit, the Biff Buff, and the Puff Pastry Hangman of budget 3D printers. Normal speed, 50 to 60 millimeters per second, an acceleration of 500 millimeters per second squared. Pretty standard, but compared to a lot of clipper enabled printers, pretty embarrassing. So what can we do? What happens when we turn up the speed? Well, this happens. So this is 250 millimeters per second and 2,500 millimeters per second squared acceleration. And this is without any modification to the firmware. And you see that pattern on either side of the X? That is ringing. And if we look at the Y, it's even worse. And I've never seen ringing so deep set. It's almost engraved in that. And the ringing even continues to the other side, which is nuts. The base is horrific. And those bulges on the edges are caused by that quick 90 degree direction change. I've never seen anything like this, but uh, then I have never printed anything that fast on an old Cartesian bed slinger printer. 
A normal Ender 3 with a Cartesian motion system will have some issues with high accelerations. A better choice would be Core XY or a Delta printer for fast printing, but lots of us have these Cartesian printers, so what can we do? Well, a hardware fix could help. The roller bearings on the Ender 3 and other budget style printers are not that great for speed or precision. Swapping it with linear rails could help, but probably not that much. But that is why I'm really excited to try out the input shaping feature on Marlin's 2.1.2 release, which just came out a few weeks ago. So how the hell do we do this? Well, if you're familiar with manually calibrating input shaping on Clipper firmware, then this is a walk in the park for you. But I'm going to assume that you don't know how to do this. But luckily, uh, Marlin has some great advice on their GitHub and on their website and they can guide you through this and but we'll also help you as well. But first, let's look at the firmware. Okay, here we go. Input shaping. Experimental. 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 Hopefully not for long, but yeah, I don't think this is going to be quite as impressive as Clipper's input shaper. So there are five variables here for input shaping. D, which is the damping factor, essentially how strong the compensation is. F is the frequency which is the input shaping defined counter frequency for resonance control. T, which is the kind of profile used. I don't think this should be changed. Pretty sure there's only one usable profile at the minute. X and Y are obviously which axis we're setting the prior variables to. For the minute, we'll just turn on input shaping and leave the values as default. Really, we only need to find out the correct damping factor and the correct frequency. So no problem, right? Okay, so caveat. We are actually going to be using Prusa Slicer for this because we are testing multiple frequencies. We're testing frequencies from 15 to 60 Hertz. And Prusa Slicer has this option where you can change the, the G code per layer. So because we're testing so many different frequencies, it would make sense to use this. Otherwise we'd be printing dozens of these ringing towers to see which one is appropriate. Uh, and that would be terrible. So Cura actually has this as a plugin, but it's not that easy to use. Prusa Slicer is just a lot more efficient. So hence we're using this. So just slap this G-code wizardry in your slicer and you can print with multiple frequencies. Now we can see what the effect of changing the frequency values had on the ringing on each layer. Find which layer has the least ringing and use a calipers to measure from the base to that layer. And then you can put that value into the formula, where Z is the number you measured. If you're lazy, TH3D have a calculator here, which you can use. Link is in the description. Do you solve the brackets first? Physics major. So we also need the damping factor. And just like before, we can do this with a G-code script using the same ringing tower. And this was taken from Marlin's GitHub. The X axis was pretty easy to calibrate, but the Y axis was a bit more difficult. It was hard to see which frequency actually worked best. They all looked a bit the same. So we did some testing and, and then some more testing and then lots of testing. And finally, we got it done. We got our frequencies and we got our damping factors. Second caveat, this works really well, but it works even better when you have linear advance dialed in really well. What is linear advance? Well, it's another firmware feature that controls the extrusion during high acceleration periods. So it prevents bulges and under extrusion and blobs when you're going from a low speed to a really, really high speed, such as when you make 90 degree turns. And this is great, but unfortunately with a lot of Creality's main boards, they use TMC2208 stepper drivers in legacy mode, and these do not play nicely with linear advance. So if you have a stock Ender 3 or something similar like that with these stepper drivers, then you sort of need to update the, the main board. And we are using BTT's SKR E3 Mini version 3, and it works really, really, really well. What were we doing again? A free, easy to use firmware update? Crap. So let's have a look at something nice and organic printed at these settings. This was printed at 0.2 millimeters layer height, and it took about 35 minutes to print. It does have some imperfections, but for that speed on an Ender 3, that is not bad at all. Okay, so Marlin input shaping is not a totally quick feature for use with a lot of 3D printers because of the need for linear advance. But once you do have a board with supported drivers, it's pretty nifty. All our tests were printed at 0.1 millimeter layer heights, except for the Benchy. And that was totally fine for the hot end that we used, which was a V6. At the highest tested speed, we were pushing PLA at about 7.6 millimeters cubed per second. 
And that was totally okay. But if we go to 0 0.2 millimeter layer heights, then that's up to about 14 millimeters cubed per second, which is also fine for the V6. But if you are using a Creality stock hot end, you probably won't be able to go to 0 0.2 because they usually max out around 12 or 13 millimeters cubed per second. So if you want to print larger layer heights, then you will have to upgrade your hot end. Hopefully in the next Marlin update, we will see an even more tuned input shaper tool. But right now, you will see better performance on a clipper enabled printer, which would be a Core XY or a Delta. The feature though is not to be ignored. If you have the board necessary to make it happen and you don't want to make the investment to clipper, then I would highly, highly recommend this. It's really good. It's free, it's easy to install, and you get a marked increase in speed. We'll continue to tinker with it. I'd say I can get some better quality, especially from the Y axis, but we'll see. If you have any questions about this, then just let us know. We're always happy to help. So you can write a comment below or write us an email. Thanks for watching, guys. See you again later.